This is a production of Cornell University. So thank you very much, Adrian, for, for the invitation and for a nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here, actually. First time at Cornell, uh, nice people and a very nice environment. So today I will be talking to you, speaking to you about growth and what can we learn by, about organogenesis in plants looking at cellular behaviors in, quantita in quantitative manner. So one of the biggest question in developmental biology is how do we get from a group of undifferentiated cells, it can be embryonic cells, it can be a primordium, into the variety of different shapes that we see in nature. So how do we get a hand instead of ear and why nose here, and et cetera, et cetera. The genetic basis of development is sort of relatively well understood. So we know the genes that are involved in uh, development of the leaf, for example. The biggest challenge is to understand how the action of those gene trans genes translate into the biological forms. And this is not a trivial question. There's no easy answer for this. We have to use specific tools to, to do that. Uh, because genes are actually acting on different general process, developmental processes. So some genes will influence patterning. So for example, the number of fingers on my, of, on my hand. Others will influence more or growth, so how much they will grow. And even other genes will be deciding, you know, okay, how do I, how they are differentiated into different tissues. So why do I have skin here and not somewhere else? We use uh, plants for, uh, to study development and lo to look at growth uh, in, uh, uh, in general. There are several reasons for this. So here we have a Arabidopsis plants, uh, plant. And actually, first of all, plants are uh, continuously growing organs. So basically, you have growth and organogenesis continuously over the whole life. In animals, of course, we know that most of the things happens in the belly of the mother, for example. So it's very difficult to observe this. So this is should become a system of Arabidopsis view from the top. Very importantly, we have a cell wall. Cell wall actually makes the cells glued together. So they do not move one in respect to another. So basically, we can observe what is the fate of the cells over time. So we know that the blue cells will give rise to a specific region later on. So we know what happens to them. And thirdly, in, uh, or especially at the early stages of organogenesis, the cell death is sort of a relatively limited factor. It's, it's not so important, like in animals. So in animals, if you want to have fingers that are separated, you will have specific uh, cell death in between them to separate them. In plants, it's less important. Of course, this is a simplification. So how do we do that? How do we look at growth in plants? So we basically uh, use confocal uh, microscope to acquire 3D uh, images like this. Uh, for example, here should apical meristem of tomato. And uh, basically uh, what we look at is the outlines of the cells that using morphographics software that is, uh, was developed by um, uh, Richard Smith, we are able now to segment those cells into, uh, segment them and basically uh, find the correspondence between the two time points after the organ has grown. Based, based on this, we can compute different heat maps. So for example, what you see here is the basic growth, so area extension of each, uh, each cell uh, with uh, cells marked in blue growing slowly and the cells that grow fast are marked in uh, red. So uh, you, you can see, for example, that at this should have become very stem, now, now you see it from the side, cells that are giving rise to the leaf primordium are growing very fast. And there will be next primordium coming up here. And you see already the growth is very high in this, uh, in this area. What can we compute as well? For example, the growth anisotropy. So basically, we can get information if the cell is growing, extending in one direction or isotropically in both. So for example, those cells are growing here. Uh, the, the longer line indicates you the principal orientation of growth of these cells. So we can do, we can use morphographics to extract this information for in a two and a half D. We call it like this because it's a surface extra, uh, quantification, but on curved surface. So it's not 3D, it's not 2D, so two and a half D, let's say. And we can do it also as well for 3D. So here what you see is a, a early leaf of cardamina and you can see the segmentation of cells uh, at the beginning after 24 hours in 3D. So those are the um, uh, mother cells and daughter cells 24 hours later, and we can do it for epidermal layer, we can do it for the L2, so deeper layers as well, 
to get the information in 3D as well. The, inf the, the data that I will show today will be more mainly on 2D uh, surfaces. So the main topic of my talk today will be looking at growth in leaves. So how, what can we learn and how powerful this technology can be to understand the development of the leaf in, a, in, a, in, a, in plants. If you go to your garden, you go outside, maybe not now, but in summer, you will appreciate that there's many, many different leaf forms. You can have leaves that are very simple, like simple blade leaves, and some, of, some other leaves will be very compound, like individual leaflets. So this makes leaves a very powerful system to study the diversification of forms in, in plants. So what do we know about the leaf growth until now? So basically most of the information comes from model species, starting from tobacco in 1933 and in Arabidopsis. So what we know is that we know how, what is the growth globally in the leaf uh, uh, distributed. So we know that, for example, in Arabidopsis, there will be a basipetal gradient of growth uh, from, from the tip to the base that will uh, restrict growth to the proximal region of, of, the, of the blade. So we know generally how this happens, and we know that this growth rates that you have, can see here, so that tells the regions growing fast uh, in red again, this growth uh, gradient is correlated with uh, differentiation of the leaf. So the uh, differentiation of the leaf will also start at the tip and will progress slowly toward the base. So the red cells here are the pavement cells, the fully differentiated uh, epidermal cells that are highlighted as a measure of the differentiation. So we globally know what's going on in the leaf. We also know what happens locally. So the, at the margin of the leaf, the leaf margin is a very important region for the uh, shape, uh, for, to shape the, uh, for shaping of the leaf form, uh, because all the protrusions, serrations, leaflets, etc., etc., will emerge from the meristematic region at the margin of the leaf. So the, in this, in this uh, margin will help to create the diversity. And we know what happens there actually. We know that auxin, hormone, plant hormone auxin is very important for the initiation of the protrusions. And there is a transcription factor CAC2, for example, that will be important for the repression of growth around uh, adjacent to those protrusions to enable them to grow out. So, Locally, it's pretty okay. We understand what's going on at the molecular level. We know what's happening globally. The big challenge that we have faced is, is to understand how those global factors and the local regulators are integrated and modulated to yield the diversity of organ forms, of leaf forms uh, that we find in nature. And to, the, to answer this question, we have used uh, actually um, two different species from Brassicaceae family. So those are the two species that are very closely related in evolution, they are, but they are very different in leaf form. So Arabidopsis thaliana, you probably all know and probably you touched it and, and tortured it in some way. So Arabidopsis is a simple leaf with a tiny serration at the margin. You can see them here on the proximal part of the leaf. And the very closely related species that is very different in morphology is Cardamina hirsuta. So Cardamina has actually a leaf subdivided into individual leaflets. So we have terminal leaflet at the tip of the leaf and then several pairs of lateral leaflets that will develop that are supported by, by a small uh, petiole. <coughs> so they are very different, but they come from the same structure. So if you go back in time and look at how what do they look like when they initiate? You cannot distinguish if this will be a compound or simple leaf. They will, the tiny leaf primordium at the beginning of the development will be the same. So in order to actually understand what's going on, we have to look in time and look at what happens to those cells that are here at the, at the beginning to give rise to, the diverse, to, diverse, to, to those different forms. So we have established a life imaging protocol to help uh, do it. And so what you will see in those movie, movies, basically, is are the, the, the heat, are, are the basically the growth of the whole leaf over one week with cells that are growing fast, uh, highlighted in red, and cells that are growing uh, slowly are blue. So we can actually now 
basically monitor the growth of both species, Arabidopsis and Cardamine, at cellular resolution for whole leaf in epidermis, basically for whole the relevant period of the development of the leaf. So we have quantitative information for every single leaf, uh, single cell in this leaf. So if you look at this as a static images uh, from one day after initiation till seven days or even eight in, a, in a Cardamine, you see the distribution of the growth. Yeah? And you are looking at this and oh my God, this is so complicated. And this was our reaction at the beginning. Like, oh, what do we do with this? Yeah? How, can, what can, how can we deal with it yeah, at the first time? So I will try to walk you through and show you some interesting uh, features. So the first question would be, they are very different. Is there something that is common for both? So is there any common, what's common for both those Arabidopsis and, and Cardamine leaf? Is there something? Maybe? Okay, so if you look at the early stages of development, so at early primordium, even if they grow with different growth rates, this is faster, this is slower, the, the early growth is homogeneous. So there's no specific region, region that is going very fast and the other ones going slowly. It's everything is just elongating, growing homogeneously everywhere. So this is what we notice. This is the first common thing. The second thing that you can notice is the basipetal gradient of growth. This is well known in Arabidopsis. You can see that the growth uh, is restricted first at the tip and is maintained more at the base of the leaf. And this is well known. We wanted to see, can we see it in, Arabi in Cardamine? Actually, yes. If you look at the growth at the tip, it's actually slowing down faster but at the more proximal regions. So we have the same behavior in the two species as well here. Another example, the growth in the midrib uh, petiole region is rather slower and more anisotropic. So basically this region is extending in one orientation, it's elongating in both species. And in the growth in the blade, future blade, is slightly faster and more isotropic. So the same in both orientation, orientations. So what we concluded out of this is that there must be some quant quantitatively, quantitative conservation of this growth. So growth is quantitatively conserved in between the two species. The same thing, basiteta gradient of growth, specific growth in the midrib, specific growth in the blade is maintained. But they are very different, yeah? extremely different. So there must be something very different to lead to those, those forms. So what you are looking here now at is uh, Arabidopsis region that uh, initiate serration, so this small protrusion at the margin of the leaf. So you can see that this pr protrusion, so the serration initiation, is associated with very high growth. So we have a lot, a lot of growth. Cells are very red, they want to grow, but this fast growth is very, very short lasting. So it's only two days that the cells are red, and then the growth is going down and uh, sort of, you know, you go whoop and stop. So what about cardamine? Initiation of the leaflet. We see the same. We have an increase of growth. The growth is fast, but the growth continues to be fast, and it continues. It continues. So basically, it's not up a stop, but it's a it continued, continued, continued here to generate the leaflet that is big and pronounced. There's one more thing on this slide that is interesting. Look at the inhibition of growth at the sinuses now. So we have this fast growth at the tip here, but we have also very strongly, a strong inhibition at the sinus, adjacent to the, uh, for, to the protrusion. So those cells are not growing. Those cells are not growing, basically uh, helping to make this indent here at the, at, the, at the serration. But this inhibition of growth is, again, very short lasting. It's two days and then it's over. Then you actually see that this region that was not growing is growing quickly. So it's uh, reverted very quickly. In cardamine, no, actually no. In cardamine, this inhibition is maintained all over our observation period. Up to eight days, there are some cells that are not growing at all, which is cool. There's one more interesting thing regarding to this inhibition, is that it happens in different developmental contexts. So if you look at the first signs when you have the inhibition, so you mark those cells that are inhibited with growth at the sinuses here, in Arabidopsis, and you make a lineage tracing to see where they end up. 
you will see that actually they are very far away from the midrib region here. So they actually, the inhibition of growth happens within the future blade already. So the blade of uh, Arabidopsis is already initiated here at this very early stages. In cardamine, if you do the same at the same stage and you mark those cells that are inhibited, they're actually directly attached to the midrib. So basically enabling the, uh, that full indentation that goes all the way back to the midrib. So it suggests that at this stage, the leaf is not yet, the, the different regions are not yet specified. Yeah, so there is the delay of differentiation that happens in, the, in, the, in cardamine leaf. So we wanted to see if there is there any differentiation that we can see, the delay of differentiation in the cell leaf. So we used, there's not magical marker for differentiation, unfortunately, there's no genetic marker. So we used a different bunch of characteristics like growth rates, uh, cell sizes, etc. And one of the things that you can look at to, to infer about the state of the differentiation of the cells is uh, the cell lobiness. So those, the cells in epidermis will start as a square, like sort of isodiametric cells, and then they will develop lobes, the pavement cells. So we have basically quantified this uh, aspect, and you can see that at Seven, already at five days after initiation, you, see, you start to see those pavement cells that start to develop here. And the whole leaf blade is sort of like transferring to this differentiated state at this seven days. In cardamine, nothing happens at, se at six days. At seven days, it starts, and it's still less advanced than in Arabidopsis, even one day later. So we concluded that the cell differentiations indeed delay in cardamine, probably enabling a huge outgrowth of the leaflets uh, in the species. So for those key differences that we observed would be the growth during the initiation of the marginal protrusion, short lasting at the, in Arabidopsis, long lasting in cardamine, and the timing of differentiation. So there are two things, the two key differences between the two species. So we wondered if this is enough to actually explain, uh, explain this. So we hypothesized that actually, if we remove this first thing, the marginal protrusion initiation, we should end up with not only with the same shapes, but also with the same growth patterns in both leaves, if the growth patterns are conserved. So to do that, we have used uh, NPE treatment, so NPE is a drug that inhibits uh, a polar auxin transport that is essential for the initiation of the new marginal protrusions. So if you inhibit the NPA, basically you will have, should have a smooth leaf. And this is what uh, we have got as uh, results for this. So here is the Arabidopsis thaliana growth series of the leaf number eight, so adult leaf with, that should have serrations after NPE treatment. And you can see that this shape is smooth, so like the both actually uh, species have the same shape, but not only the shape, but also the growth patterns are the same. So you can see the basipetal gradient of growth in both species. You can see also that the growth and isotropy is the same. So here you have a heat map of growth and isotropy. So basically the more cyan is the cell, the more is elongating. And you can see this all region of the petiole midrib is elongating in both species and the blade is more homogeneous in growth in Arabidopsis, in Arabidopsis and in cardamine. So there you have similar growth patterns. So there's a sort of conserved default growth in both species. So this default growth will consist of few things. At early stages, we have a uniform elongation of the tiny primordium. Later on, the basipetal gradient of growth will be established within the leaf. And this, this basipetal gradient of growth uh, will be followed by the tissue-dependent growth polarity. So midrib petiole will elongate, leaf blade will be just expanding in all directions equally. So is this simple description sufficient to describe what is happening in the leaf? This is very difficult to, to do in uh, the experimentation, so we decided to do modeling. And basically we have uh, uh, we have taken all the observations from, the, uh, from our biological uh, experiments, from our life imaging, and we have implemented, actually Adam Runyons has implemented a model to simulate these behaviors in silicon computer. So here he has assumed that early primordial is, is, the growth is anisotropic, 
In the later uh, primordium, growth is anisotropic in the midrib, petiole, and it's isotropic in the leaf blade. Simple assumptions. Then he also assumed that there is a gradient of growth that is established over time when primordium is growing too big, the, the uh, bigger than, than some thresholds, the differentiation front will progress from the tip to the base. So he has implemented those simple assumptions in the model, and this is what he has got. So in this movie, this is a simulation with warmer regions growing fast and bluer regions growing slower. And you can see that basically using few assumptions, you can generate a simple, smooth leaf uh, phenotype in a computer simulation. And that was awesome. And uh, this is how this compares to real data. So this is simulated uh, growth rates in the cactus free mutants, which lacks serrations at the leaf margin. And this is the real data for growth. And this is the same for anisotropy. So we can even uh, see small emerging anisotropies at the base that are also visible at the base of the real, real leaf. That was really cool. And we were like, oh my gosh, fantastic. So, but this is not the end of the story, yeah? So we know how to do my simple leaf with a simple assumptions. So how to do, what do, you, what do we need to do to get serrations? Okay. I mentioned to you already at the introduction that in order to get the protrusion at the margin, you need to have auxin maximum forming and inhibition of growth around the protrusion probably uh, due to the activity of CAC2 uh, transcription factor. We also see that the growth at the protrusion, at the serration, is very high. So this is from our data. Another thing that we observe is that the growth is repolarized. So at locally, whenever auxin maximum is uh, created, the growth rate, the growth orientations will be pointing to this spot. So it will be like a local organizer of the tissue growth that will start to grow toward the, 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 this, this small uh, protrusion. So what Adam has done again is that basically he has implemented all this information and he has created a marginal uh, model where uh, activity of pin, CAC, and auxin leads to accumulation of auxin at specific spots, spots so at the beginning of the initiation of the leaf and later at the initiation sites of the primordia. And so basically what he has done, he has taken this model, this marginal model, and put it on top of the simple model that I have shown you before. The simple model that generates a simple leaf form. And now this margin is instructing the tissue inside to repolarize and grow locally faster. So and if you do that, this is what you get, uh, basically. So your primary will be growing homogeneously, you will have a decrease of growth from the tip slowly establishing, but you also have the increase of growth at the tips of serrations due to the accumulation of the auxin, and you will slowly actually emerge progressively the, the leaf that actually uh, has serrations on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the margin. And if you compare it to real data again, so this time I just show you the growth anisotropies here, you can see that in, simulated, uh, in simulation, the growth anisotropies are sort of matching quite nicely what we see in the uh, real data. So there's alignment of growth in the midrib, for example, that can, we can observe here. We have this radiating anisotropies here that are also observed here, and leaf blade is growing more isotropically. So this is more like disorganized growth in both orientations. This is even better now. It's also so cool again for us uh, to see this. But the real challenge starts here. So how do we, is, this, is there any way to transform Arabidopsis leaf into cardamina-like leaf? Can we make compound leaf out of Arabidopsis? Let's see. Before we started, we decided, okay, we have decided to explore again computationally in simulations. What will you need to do to the leaf to the protrusion at the margin in order to, to make it out, to transform it from tiny serrations into the uh, leaflets. So Adam has uh, created a simulation of the leaf margin only. So the simulation is actually taking uh, into account several factors. So there's a, he's implemented the simulations basic petal gradient of growth. So you have a grow, 
growth at the base. So now the leaf is sort of flipped, you see? So it's not upwards, so it's flipped. So we have a growth zone that, so the, whenever the leaf is bigger, this will drop, the growth will not occur anymore here. You will have a patterning at the margin that is associated with activity of auxin, which promotes growth, and the CAC transcription factor that inhibits growth. So those are very simple simulations. And in, in, in real life, in a real simulation, it looks more or less like this. So you will have a, a growth, a growth that will be very fast here. There will be zone where the growth will be decreasing. Growth is actually not anymore here. And you will have uh, oxygen maxima that will lead to the emergence of those protrusions at the margin. So this is how, uh, the, how this model will look like in Arabidopsis wild type. So you can see that it can reproduce uh, the serrations that we observe at the margin. They, there's also a very nice observation that you can see here that the serrations are not symmetric, and this is the true reality in the leaf. They are not symmetric. They are sort of like uh, tilted towards, uh, toward the, the, the tip of the leaf. And we started to explore different things. So what he has done first, he decided, okay, what will happen if we extend the growth domain? So what we do here is we have the same growth rates, but we just make it longer. So it lasts for longer, yeah? So it's sort of like delaying differentiation somehow, enabling the leaf to grow longer. Actually, what happens here is that the serrations are smooth. So it's a sort of opposite to uh, what we see in uh, cardamine. So this is not sufficient. So what he has also tried to do is to decrease the growth. So he decreased the longitudinal growth. So he, the, dom the domain is the same. So the length is the same. But the growth is not high, but it's just decreased. If you do that, then you have the sort of slightly more pronounced protrusions that emerge, but still not so much. Later on, he decided to do, OK, I will combine the two. I extend the, growth, the possibility to growth, and I make this growth slow. So this is what happens. You have a quite pronounced protrusions now. And this is sort of those two effects are sort of uh, the ones that you could see if you delay differentiation, sort of like a meristematic tissue, growing slowly at the shoot apical meristem, not differentiating, this is growing uh, not so fast. Okay, so this is what seems to be needed, okay? And fortunately, there is a gene that is actually very important for the development of cardamine wild-type leaf, compound leaf. It's called STM, so should, have meris uh, should meristem less, and maybe you know this one. It's a meristematic gene that is important for, to maintain the meristem. And in normal Arabidopsis thaliana leaves, it's not expressed. It's not there. But in cardamine, it's actually there. It's expressed. It's reused re, 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 re uh, during development of the cardamine leaf. And if you remove this gene from cardamine compound leaf, you have it, you have it simple. Okay? So, it's obviously very important gene for development of the compound leaf and plays on differentiation. Okay, so what we decided to do is to see what happens if we put it to Arabidopsis. So here it's a, the, it's a wild type Arabidopsis and just to remind you, the growth at the protrusion is short lasting. So just two days and then it stops, drops down. Now what we do is that we express STM promoter, uh, STM gene under leaf specific promoter. So we force it to Arabidopsis leaf. And what you can see here actually is that now the serration does not stop growing. It continues for quite longer. So basically you actually do what happens in cardamine. You put the ability to grow for longer uh, to this leaf. So you delay differentiation and by delaying differentiation. And this is also visible actually in different part of the leaf. Because if you look at the distal part of the leaf, in a wild type, all growth is gone. Here, just tomato are still growing. In BLS STM pro, uh, plants, transgenic line, you have the growth that still occurs. So basically, you, yeah? That promoter is throughout the leaf, or is it? It's, uh, it's starting from two to three days after initiation. And then it's uh, mostly on the more lateral proximal regions. Right. It's on this, this, this part. It's not expressed so much here in uh, Arabidopsis. So basically, now you, sp you push the regions that are growing to more lateral parts and more distal parts. And you can also actually quantify it well, because if you do the full lineage tracing of the early leaf, and you mark 20% of cells at the tip of the leaf, 
and you look what happens to them at the end of observation, you still have about 20% of this, this surface that is marked with this, with this, uh, the, those, the, this color, yeah? So there's no, it's sort of relatively small contribution to the leaf surface uh, area. If you do the same in Arabidopsis thaliana BLSSTM transgenic line, you do the same selection and you end up by a region that is two times bigger, which actually confirms that you push growth toward more distal regions of the leaf. And this is actually matching what happens in cardamina, because in cardamina early leaf, if you mark the 20% region, it will become about half of the leaf surface in, in total, which is very cool. So we are pushing the leaf of Arabidopsis toward cardamina, but still it's not sufficient, yeah? Because here you have a wild type with small serrations. This is the BLS-STM. This is more complex, but it's not compound. So something is missing, still. So what is missing? Maybe local growth repression. And there is, a, we have discovered in 2014 and published uh, 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 the paper about RCO. So RCO is a, a transcription factor that is involved in leaf complexity in cardamina, and it's a local growth repressor. We have shown that it's acting locally at the sinus to repress growth, and if you remove it from light type, you will get simplified leaf. So we decided to look at the growth in globally in, our, in, in this transgenic line. So here we have wild type again. And just as a reminder, you have two serrations marked with star, and the region in between is slower growing. So this is like, I would say, three to 400% growth per, and over 24 hours. is about 200, so two times slower growth. If we now express RCO genomic version from cardamina in Arabidopsis, this region is actually, uh, this, those cells are not growing so fast anymore. So basically, it leads to deeper indentation at the sinus uh, in between two, two serrations, leading to a more lobe leaf. So this is more lobed leaf compared to a wild type if you express RC of cardamina, but this is, an, again, not a compound leaf. Obviously not a compound leaf. What is the promoter there that you're expressing? This is an RCO promoter, its own promoter. So it's genomic uh, region of the RCO uh, gene. Okay, so Adam came back with his model. He has taken this uh, model where you extend growth domain and decrease longitudinal growth, simulating STM action, actually. And he has added RCO, local growth repression at the base of those protrusions. And this is what the model suggests, what should happen with a very simple geometric models. Of course, this model is not perfect, so we wanted to check it. And we took this global factor, this global STM gene that delays differentiation. We took the local growth repressor that also leads to a more complex leaf, and we basically crossed them, hoping that we'll get something nice. And actually, this is what we got, yeah? Which is very cool. We have basically got a Arabidopsis compound leaf by expressing two transcription factors uh, inside the Arabidopsis leaf that are important for compound leaf development in cardamina. And if you compare this double transgenic line with wild type uh, cardamina, you can see that it's sort of quite similar. You have now leaflets supported by a sessile, uh, um, like a petiolule, similar to cardamina. It's not identical, but it's quite nice. So we probably managed to cardaminize uh, Arabidopsis in this case. And so my conclusions from the talk are, talk is are basically two. By quantitative modulation of growth and differentiation, you can, you can produce a large diversity of the leaves. So leaves have common programs that are quantitatively uh, 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 modulated to generate diversity. And what is even more amazing that is that by expressing two factors, two genes from a compound leaf into the simple, in simple leaf background, we can generate uh, complexity, which is very, very, very nice. So what next? I, I basically concluded my talk now, but I just want to show you one slide uh, to tell you what are we going in the future for. This one, so the, my lab is now working, well, among others, uh, things about, on the development of homologous organs in, the, in, um, in uh, Arabidopsis. So what do you need to make the leaf versus sepal, which are both um, 
supposed to derive from the ancient leaf-like structures. So we have doing the time-lapse imaging of the first leaf, uh, for example, and the, and the time-lapse of the sepals in, uh, in Arabidopsis. So we are able now to grow, look at the growth up to nine days. Uh, and we are also interested in the development of uh, organs in more ancient plants, uh, so non-vascular plants, to understand how they build this very simple structure and also how this compared to the uh, vascular plants. And I would like to thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, um, uh, the work that I have presented is done still in the Mitos Chantis lab. And the most important person to highlight is Adam Runions, who has done all the modeling uh, part. Uh, Richard Smith is the developer of the software of morphographics, who we are using all the time. And this is uh, uh, our uh, group now in Montreal. And more precisely, this is our group here. Uh, this is my group, actually. And we are closely collaborating with uh, the lab of Anlis Routier, who is a modeler and, uh, and uh, develop, has also developed more for graphics. So um, uh, this is our new environment in Montreal. And we hope that we will get something very nice very soon to show you uh, another, another, another seminar or other, another conference. The, here are also our funding. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, go for it. Okay, so I haven't thought through this question, so I'll think through it in real time as I ask it. Um, so with the various modeling and then your introduction of the various constructs to alter complexity of the leaf, um, so nothing really happens to the midrib or do you get a compression of growth or I'm just wondering, you know, how do you deal with the midrib and so, so things? This is actually a very simplified version of the talk because the paper is pretty intensive and quite complex. And the pointing to the rib is a very good uh, point because actually midrib also plays a very important role in uh, this uh, change of the shape of the leaf. Because what actually happens in, uh, uh, in the BLS STM transgenic line is not only that you push the growth toward more external and like lateral compartments of the leaf, but you also decrease the growth of growth in the petiole. So basically, you even more amplified what happens. So you decrease this growth to make it even more, you know, like sort of narrow at the base. And this effect is very important. We can see it that the, the midrib is actually growing slower in, uh, in cardamine and in BLS strand incline compared to uh, what we see in the wild Arabidopsis. And this, this sort of interaction between the fast growing and slow growth is actually very important for the complexity of organs anyway. And uh, so for example, the first leaf of Arabidopsis is not producing any serrations, even if there are oxygen maxima happening at the margin of this first leaf. And this is most likely due to the very, very fast growth of the, uh, of the leaf, especially in the, you know, in the proximal distal orientation. So basically you could make it, but you barely make it and smooth it. And this is also happening in some mutants. In the leaf number eight of uh, some mutants, you will not have any serrations. And this will be just, it's not because of the no, patterning is not taking place. There is oxygen maximum. There is a small bump very often that happens, but it's like it's, it loses the, 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 the competition with the longitudinal elongation of the leaf. So yes, this is very important actually, uh, part of making the compound leaf. So it's slightly complicated to explain in a very short talk, yeah? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I've sort of forgot the names already. The, the, the last gene you were talking about, the RCO. I asked a question about the promoter. Okay. Yeah. If you use that promoter and just drive a, a reporter gene, how, how, where is that? Okay, I don't have this slide here, I guess, but if I go back to, okay. oh, sorry, this moment. If I go back to the leaf, here, so this is a fully developed leaf, but just uh, as a simplification, it will be expressed at the sinuses and around the uh, around the initiating protrusion. So, that so at the question, base, that drives the question one step backwards. Then, what makes it do that? 
why is it all? Oh, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't know yeah, yet, yeah? yeah that's, that's, uh, we don't know who is actually putting this uh, there at this position. Yeah, yes. But we know, we know that uh, there is a, a homologue of this gene in Arabidopsis, which, which is called LMI1 gene. And LMI1 uh, is basically the same, the same gene. It it's produces a very similar protein. That you can swap LMI and, and RCO uh, and drive them under RCO promoter. They will do exactly the same thing. But the domain of expression is very different. So if you'd express, LMI is expressed distally at the leaf margin and, uh, and in the stipules, and RCO is at the base of the leaf and not in the stipules. Uh, so yeah, so we don't know who is controlling the expression of this, but there is a very specific uh, evolutionary pressure to put them in a specific position. And those gene actually, this is exactly the same gene drive, uh, the, so LMI or RCO family gene, the, is responsible for the, de the development of the tendrils in, in P. So it is expressed in the very distal regions of the terminal leaflets of the, of the P, and uh, not in the stipules, uh, like in Arabidopsis. And if you remove it, you get normal leaf. So it's a, uh, I forgot the name of the, of the gene in, in P, but yeah, it's, it's the same gene, uh, basically. But again, just tweaked to, to be expressed somewhere else. And this same gene actually uh, inhibits the, in the, 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 the development of the stipules at the base of the leaf. So the stipules are expressing LMI gene, so equivalent of RCO. You remove LMI, you have the stipules transforming into leaf blades. So and P does not have any RCO or LMI expression in the stipule, and the stipule is like a leaf blade, basically. I have another question. So um, I. I can't remember, does uh, the cardamine? Cat cardamine, yeah. yeah um, or cardamine. Yeah, oh. there's, um, so all of these serrations are uh, sort of heteroplastic traits associated with yes. the phase change. Yes, yes. And so is there a similar heteroplastic series in? Cardamina? Cardamina? Yes, it is. And, yeah. and then therefore, the competency to respond to all of this of is course. overlaid over all of this. Yes, yes, exactly. So the first leaf of cardamina is simple. It expresses RCO, but it does not do anything, probably because of uh, different dynamics of growth of the leaf number one, which is very different from leaf number eight, which is different from the col colline leaf. Yeah? So yes, indeed. And in cardamina, you have a first leaf that will be simple with just sort of terminal leaflet. Over time, you have more and more pairs of the lateral leaflets. And then you will uh, also have the... Um, the small colline leaves that are sort of compound with different forms, sort of compressed and smaller. I see. Yeah. So, so, uh, so maybe you've mentioned this already, but this promoter uh, is active in all. Uh, this, of the, so, this promoter, before we started working with it, it was supposed to work five days after initiation onwards. But actually, we have checked the expression. It starts like two, two, uh, two days after initiation, so quite early. Maybe even earlier, but we haven't uh, checked. And uh, its uh, expression domain would be, if I look, if I do it just on this one, it would be like more lateral uh, domain and more proximal domain. So it will not be expressed at the tip. It will be relatively not expressed in the in the middle. So it's it's there. It's not a native expression of the STM in cardamina. It's not exactly the same expression, but by using this specific promoter, we managed to put it in this position where it's needed for the action. And actually, what I think is that we could replace the STM gene with something else that is meristematic, like a BP gene, for example, and we would probably get the same uh, function. So it's, not, so it's probably not the specificity of this specific you know, gene to do this. It's just, okay, we make the leaf grow slower and differentiate slow, uh, grow, uh, grow slower for longer period of time. And that will make it more complex, basically. Yeah? So that's why we are talking about quantitative, not qualitative change uh, that really drives diversity of organs. Yeah? So all the same mechanisms are just regular, operating there. You just delay differentiation, inhibit growth a little bit more, et cetera. So tweaking this, uh, this thing. I would say. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that the midrib grows slowly and um, with more anisotropy. Yeah. Um, do we know 
what makes it do that? Or so we, we, do, we are not sure about it. So what we suppose happen, happens is that uh, at the, it happens slightly later, at later stages of development. So I would say, you know, you would have to go a little bit, uh, uh, is it working? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. If we go back to this growth, so here, it is, not, it is happening not at the very, very early stages, it's slightly later. You can see it very pronouncedly here. So at this stage, uh, the main vascular strand, you know, the main mid vein of the leaf is already developed. So I've, you cannot make the growth, uh, growth in the mid, uh, mid vein uh, isotropic. It has to be an isotropic. It has to, it's sort of fixed. So what can happen is actually that the veins that are developing underneath in the internal tissue, uh, they fix the growth. Yeah? But what we think is that the patterning and the, 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 the polarization of the leaf, the growth polarization, is regulated by auxin and pins, etc., but locally, and then this, this mechanism is just take, or taken over by other things, vascular tissue or just the isotropic growth in the leaf blade. So the, the polarizer is there, but it's probably not regulating all over the leaf development. It's just locally setting first axis that is taken over by vascular tissue, then the next axis are initiated. After some time, they, they fade again, etc., etc. This is likely scenario. Of course, there are other uh, um, uh, hypotheses on this, that there is a global polarizer that operates all over the leaf. But so here we show basically by modeling and by some experimentation that it is not necessary to generate those forms somehow. In the DLSSTM RCO or Avidopsis, the veins are really, really strange. Um, yes. They don't converge well. Um, so do you think oxygen transport is disrupted? And so in line with that, do you have differences in the frequency of convergence points, like i.e. serrations? So yeah, so there is one point. One point so for answering the second question, is there a difference in the, in the amount of the convergence points? In between wild type Arabidopsis and BLS, STM, yes, indeed. And you can have, an, normally in Arabidopsis, you have basipetal gradient of initiation of the, uh, of the serrations, so they will appear one after another. In the STM, BLS STM, you can have, or you like sort of hijacked, sometimes you will have uh, additional protrusions emerging in more distal regions or in between. To pin for that to happen based on you, you need the pin, but you basically need non differentiated tissue. In wild type arabidopsis, you will never have a serration that appears up of the first one because those cells, the marginal cells, are already elongating and they are just. Lo they lose a capacity to initiate any protrusion. In BLSSTM, those cells are actually dividing. So sometimes you have a region with small meristematic cells that will have expression of pin, and they will lead to uh, initiation of additional protrusions. So I guess there's a nuance there. Is it so in BLSSTM? Is it just that you have the growth potential to make a serration? Or is it that you actually have more convergence points? You have both. You have a little. You can have a more convergence point, but you have also poten more longer potential for generation of those guys. And this BLSSTM, you can, if you, I don't know if you have. We can have it here. If we come back one slide before, you see, uh, it is not. They have additional protrusions at the at the leaf lobes. Yeah. So those are exactly this. This is what I'm talking about. You can see them here. You can see it here. This was the first one initiated, but there's a second one coming here. So they have both uh, potential to do both things. And uh, if you come back to the first uh, question, it is not identical. But this leaf form is still not identical. And this size of the leaf is not identical. So the cardamina will, leaf, uh, will be, sorry, Arabidopsis will be like standard Arabidopsis. Cardamina will be standard Cardamina. So there's some other things. And actually, you probably make the compound leaf, but you freeze, this, you freeze the development of this leaf slightly earlier. But because those serrations here that happens, they also are embedded here. Because you see those small indents here? Those are serrations, but they are sort of hidden and very tiny. They are basically, this terminal leaflet grows for longer and is filling up the space in between. So this is smaller, this is bigger. There's something else that is important uh, that makes it slightly different still, yeah? It's compound, both are compound, but not identical. And the same happens here. Now it's still, it's sessile, uh, sorry, like with the petiole, uh, petiolule, 
on both, but this is much more pronounced. There's one, there's one vein, there's maybe two veins coming, yeah? So it's not identical, but we are pretty close. Did the reduction in N cause that? I think uh, what is happening here is uh, uh, that uh, you uh, have other factors that will make this differentiate faster. So they, they, it does not have enough time to grow enough big to fill out those spaces, maybe even to generate some this, this modification of the, um, of the vascular tissue. But in vascular tissue, it can be also pin, yeah? Like, it's not exactly the same context, yeah? Because leaf of Arabidopsis, if you take, for example, leaf number one, it starts to differentiate at two days after initiation. You have some marginal cells that are tiny primordium, they will be already there and they will never divide anymore. So which is very amazing because you look at some tiny, tiny, tiny thing that you're supposed to be more systematic, but it's not, or not yet, not, uh, not anymore in some, at least in some, some cells. Yeah? So from two days after initiation, you will trace lineage for some marginal cells and they will be there, yeah? A little like, like in sepals, yeah? The giant cells will also start quite early, yeah? Maybe not so early like in the leaf, but, uh, but still like three, four days after initiation, yeah? Yeah, so. Okay. Is there still for the questions? So thank you. Thanks this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.